things I'm going to say were planned before I knew that Daniel is going to be here. But still, <laughs> I will still say that. Uh, Daniel is an old friend and colleague who's uh, been much older than me, who's grows to the point where we are today, I've been Catholic for many years. <coughs> and his attempt, which who am I to say whether it should be successful or not, to fundamentally rethink linguistics is one of the most daring, and for me, in my eyes, really important attempts ever since the Chomsky Revolution. Because uh, the Chomsky Revolution made us move from linguistics, uh, forgetting historical linguistics to a great extent, eliminating all biological thinking out of linguistics, and certainly eliminating any social type of thinking. <coughs> when I first started getting interested in linguistics, the kind of things I read were way before Bloomfield or Xavier Harris or these things. I read, for example, Jesperson and these type of things. And this type of linguistics had at the time an open quest for trying to introduce more order, system, sometimes even daring to look for algorithmic solutions, but in all areas, including syntax, including semantics, etc. And then came the Chomsky Revolution, which actually displaced serious attempt to think broadly about semantics, uh, and trying to make the point with an enormous financial success and seriousness, that actually this can be replaced if you do well enough the kind of Chomsky and syntactic approach. And uh, similarly, like in economics and in other areas, in other areas where the development went in a mathematical, algorithmic, formalizing uh, way and disposed or displaced previous attempts, we are now at a point that I think, I'm not sure we be wrong on that, that we have exhausted, in every sense, the possible achievements on a purely formalistic, algorithmic, uh, mathematization type of mode. But we should go backwards, actually. The achievements are enormous achievements. And the question is, can we build on these achievements and reintroduce in economics, we are talking, I am at least talking about repo repoliticizing economics. In linguistics, I think we should be looking as an aim at introducing social construction of meaning, which Danny is dealing with, historical linguistics, not replacing the Chomskyan achievements, but building on it. Let's say for me, this is one of the most important discipline building innovations and exercises that can be undertaken. Unbelievably risky. As I say, who am I to say whether the Danny will succeed or not? But I can only applaud enormously the daring to get into it. And I think we are given the unique privilege to be able to listen to the first I think it's the first time that you are allowed to this say this. Hello. Hello. We have the privilege to listen to the launching of the series, and I think I can encourage you to be as critical as you can be, because this is a stage. Patty, I know that there's no danger. You don't. Need, you don't need the encouragement, but maybe, but maybe some others do. So, so excuse me for being cheeky. No, no, you, you will get it. But uh, there are some others who may need the encouragement. Because this will finally go into the next stages of thinking. And I think you are ready for it. You have to rewrite, rethink, rewrite. It's an enormous enterprise. And I am glad that you reached the point. I welcome you here. I am proud of it that we are the place where you started. And we will try it out and then see where it leads. Good night. Thank you very much. Uh, I would first of all like to uh, by, by, by thanking. Uh, Yehuda and uh, Ivona uh, and Ivan Kaste uh, for, for making all this uh, possible, not just in terms of coming here to give the series of talks.
got, but also in terms of uh, the, uh, the grant that allowed me to uh, not teach this year uh, and not run departments or schools and just uh, sit and, and try to, to put all this thing uh, in writing. It's a process. It's, it's a project that I've been in for, for many, many years now. Um, and um, I just finished doing the six lectures <coughs> once uh, in Tel Aviv just now for, for a group of linguists. And this is the first time that I'm going to talk about this uh, to, to a group of people. I think most of you, or maybe all of you, are not linguists. This is going to probably change some of the dynamics that are going to take place here, but this is exactly one of the reasons why it's so interesting for me uh, to do this. Before I start, I just want to say one extended word of thanks for Yuda, because uh, as far as Yuda is concerned, this is not just a matter of inviting me here or, or, or any other part of this thing. Um, I think it's almost 20 years ago uh, today uh, that I sat with Yuda in his office in Tel Aviv. Um, um, you know, talking to him about my, um, I don't know, uh, critical feelings about the Chomsky um, project. Uh, I was basically a student of linguistics, uh, feeling that it's a project that's taking linguistics somewhere that it doesn't have to go uh, uh, because of questions of meaning, because of social questions, and so on. And uh, Yuda uh, did something that I can only describe now uh, as uh, looking at the crystal ball on this table. And, and saying, uh, I'll tell you what I see in the future. Uh, it was like, you will have to go on studying within the linguistic paradigm, finish a PhD within it, then uh, start writing, move from linguistics to the social sciences, and then when you do that, you'll be able to actually put all the parts together, and actually this is exactly what happened. So uh, for me, uh, giving a, a first talk in a series about my theory of language that has the words social construction of meaning in here is uh, in here uh, is apart from being other things it is also a tribute to the, 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 the great friendship with you and you yourself and it's a very very exciting moment uh, for me uh, this thing is a series of lectures and it's important for me to say that because the six lectures are not about different things they are all about the same thing and uh, my feeling at the moment respect to what I'm trying to say is that six lectures is a minimum because there's a lot of stuff that I want to be able to show you in terms of like a general description of language that is very very different as far as I can tell from all the different other major descriptions that you have in the social sciences, in the cognitive sciences, in formal linguistics and so on and I will need quite some time, I think something like three lectures, the first three lectures uh, just to um, um, build the picture, tell you what I think language is about. Uh, and only then uh, would I be able to start discussing and discussing with you some of the questions that are, uh, that are of interest. Um, so uh, basically in the next three lectures, what I'm going to do, if, if you think in terms of speech, it's, I'm going to tell a story. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm just going to describe, I'm going to you know, put on a, a, a picture of the way I look at language, um, different aspects of the picture. By the time we get to the point where the picture is going to be there on the board, we're going to be able to start thinking in terms of uh, implications and so on. So I really would encourage you, and, and you know, I would love that if you did come to the next lectures, uh, and we're going to have the, uh, the um, video of the lecture ready for people who couldn't come today and if they want to come next week they'll be able to watch it because it's going to be quite difficult I think to follow what's going to happen in the next, next, next lectures if you're not here uh, uh, today. Just two short uh, you know, paragraphs about the picture before I start describing it. Something, you know, two things that I want to say about it from the outside before I get into actually drawing uh, the, the picture. Uh, the first uh, is this. Within linguistics, um, you've had, um, I would say, a major competition between two worldviews. Uh, one that basically sees language as a social entity, 
and the other that basically sees language as a cognitive entity, something that happens inside the mind. Okay? Uh, if you think in terms of language as a cognitive capacity, then generally speaking, details aside and so on, um, the secret to language, the secret to what language is and who we are as speakers of language, the secret is in the mind, this way or the other. Okay? And Chomsky has a certain way of looking at it. And then you have, say, the functionalists, the people who think about language as a cognitive entity but have the opposite views to Chomsky's. Okay? Uh, if you think about language as a social entity, then something about the essence of language, what language is, uh, has to be explained in social terms basically as a collective invention, basically as something that was invented by people for usage for communication. Okay? Now, in terms of the relationship between these two perspectives, you have three general types of, of, of thinking. And again, I'm, I'm abstracting away from details because we don't have the time for that. We, we can do that after the lecture. But basically, most, the great majority of people who think about language as a cognitive entity simply ignore language as a social entity. It, it's just something that is out of their uh, um, vision. Okay? And you have all kinds of explanations and ideas for why this is justified from the point of view of um, of the theory, but for example, uh, uh, Chomsky says explicitly uh, that questions about language as a social entity are secondary questions um, to be dealt with by whoever is interested on the basis should on the basis of the understanding of language as the, the, the big thing as a cognitive capacity. Okay, um, uh, it's quite obvious, I think, to whoever ever read anything of Chomsky, that he says maybe social questions are interesting and important, but he never gets to deal with them, it's not interesting for him, and so on. So one, one general perspective is language is a cognitive entity, we don't care about the social stuff. Most of the people who care about the social stuff are really disinterested in the cognitive issues, okay? So sociolinguists, anthropological linguists, and, and, and generally people in the social sciences, in critical studies, wherever, um, who understand that language is extremely important from the social uh, you know, perspective and who think about language as a social entity, this is important, uh, basically uh, have no interest in the question of say, you know, what happens in the brain when you talk, or, you know, stuff like that. And, and okay, that there is another perspective. Uh, Sperber and Wilson, relevance theory is an example, but there are some others. People who say, okay, Social questions are interesting. In order to be able to answer them, we have to understand language as a cognitive entity. And then on the basis of that, we'll be able to explain what's happening on the social level. Okay? The perspective that I'm adopting is the fourth one, which says, in order to be able to understand what's happening with language at the cognitive level, we first of all have to understand language as a social entity. Okay? So, if you want, um, uh, what I'm trying to say is related in certain ways to, for example, Vygotsky or to Michael Tomasello, uh, but it's also very, very different from what they're doing. But the, the, the general thing is, let's understand language as a social entity because this is what language is, it's a social thing. And then once we understand what language is as a social thing, we'll be able to understand what is happening in the mind. You will see that things will connect much more quickly than the way I'm putting it now, but it's important for me to, to, uh, uh, to say that from the very beginning. What I'm trying to do, part of the major part of what I'm trying to do, is take linguistics and drag it back to the social sciences. Make it a social science again, uh, bring it back to where it was in this sense, for example, in the days of Sapir, Edward Sapir, uh, um, whom you probably uh, know from the sapir Wharf hypothesis, a horrible place to know Sapir from, uh, because uh, uh, Sapir was probably the most important, the most serious, and deepest linguist of the 20th century. Wharf, don't start me on him. Uh, uh, and and the history created a situation where the totally amateurish work of Worf is for most people now what we know about Sapir, and this is, you know, this is in parentheses uh, an important issue, but 
uh, dragging linguistics back to the, to, to, to the social sciences, and if you want, founding the cognitive science in a new way that will help the social science of linguistics to enjoy. So not forget about the cognitive aspect, but put society first. That's the first thing. The second thing that I want to say about the picture that I'm going to give you is that it is, in the most general terms, a picture of the relationship between language and experience. That's the name, the title of the series of lectures. It is a, a theory of the way language functions within the overall uh, uh, context of experience. Okay? Now, two things, two very, very quick things about experience, because I don't want to get into that at, at the stage we're in, maybe later. First, the relationship between language and experience is probably um, um, one of the most um, problematic points uh, in wherever you go and, and you hear or you read people talk about language. The relationship with an experience is, is, is a difficult point. For Chomsky, uh, experience just doesn't count. Okay? So language is an entity that is divorced from everything that we know about experience. Experience doesn't help us in terms of learning language because we already have a knowledge of whatever is important about uh, language. Uh, language is not about meaning, so questions of experience are, un uh, are not important. Actually, when I talked uh, to linguists uh, just now when I finished the series with a group of linguists, one of the most important things that I actually learned from the experience was what a caricature <coughs> perception people in linguistics today have of the notion of experience um, because as far as many linguists are concerned, Chomsky said back in the 60s, experience is that stupid thing that Skinner was talking about. And, you know, in, when, when Chomsky wrote the review of verbal behavior, uh, experience is behaviorism, experience is something that doesn't acknowledge that there, are, as a, there, there is a mental life and so on. Uh, uh, so as far as Chomsky's relationship with experience is concerned, it's not there. Functionalists, the people who oppose Chomsky in linguistics, um, played by Chomsky's rules in Chomsky's um, um, you know, uh, yard, uh, and because of that, they say that everything that we need to understand about language comes from experiences. Experience is something that can be easily um, reduced to questions of experience. So it's, it's either 100% experience or 0% experience. And then within the social sciences, within what is called um, the linguistic term in the social sciences, there is a huge emphasis on the idea that language structures our experiences. We look at the world, we experience the world through, uh, through language. Okay? Uh, what I'm going to try to talk about in this, in this series, and especially in the description of the first three lectures, is to talk about the relationship between language and experience in a much more dialectic way, and I'm going to start with the assumption, okay, that I think is totally correct, but it's, I have to say that because a lot of you are coming from the social scientists, I'm going to start with the assumption that the notion of experience is there independently of language, and that we are experiencing creatures, just like other animals, uh, experiencing, experience is the general name for the entirety of the mental life of every creature with a central nervous system, okay? So, uh, we experience, and dogs experience, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, Eva Yorlokra, uh, whom some of you know, uh, an evolutionary biologist, uh, Eva and I wrote uh, a series of papers on the evolution of language that will come into the story that I'm going to tell here in a very interesting way, I think. Uh, she is now, uh, interested in the question of when biologically did experience begin, okay? Uh, and as far as as far as she is concerned, um, even creatures without a nervous, a central nervous system, like medusas, for example, already experience in very very interesting ways. So experiencing is something that is 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 uh, is much more ancient, uh, much more fundamental to the way our minds work. And I'm not going to get into the detailed account of what experience is, because this is something that I want to, you know, bring in the way through uh, the lectures. But I'm going to start with the notion that experience is something that is not totally determined by language, the way at least some vulgar 
conceptions in, in the social uh, sciences. Uh, okay, so language within experience and first language as a social entity, then language as a cognitive entity. Yeah. I'm not quite sure I understood what you mean by experience. This seems that this is going to be fundamental uh, to uh, what's going to happen from now on. That's why I'm asking. Okay, so, so I, I can look. I, 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 I'm talking about some kind of uh, internal mental consciousness of. Uh, no, 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 consciousness, consciousness is not. The, the, thing is the accumulation, the total accumulation of all the mental processes that are involved in our interaction with the world. Okay? Uh, we see, we hear, we do things, we try and we fail, we have all the sense impressions uh, of this accumulated in our mind, creating certain types of generalizations and so on. This is basically, basically, this is the type of thing that is the most fundamental uh, um, thing that makes us mental creatures. Okay? It's, think of it in the most general sense of the word, and let me let me move on a little bit, and you'll see the thing will take shape. Okay? Uh, I haven't understood yet, but perhaps as you know, as your talk informs, I'll get the idea. Okay. Okay. Let, let, let's let's uh, let, let's try to do that. Um, so we think about language as a as a social invention, as a set of conventions. Okay, um, and. Once you start thinking about language as a social invention, as something that wasn't there before and then gradually came to be because people collectively decided to, to, to create or invent something of that type. If you start thinking in these terms, and I think that the first step that you have to take is try to understand the essence of life, social life, experiential life, whatever, at the moment when you still do not have language. Okay? You still do not have language for communication. Think about any other type of invention. Okay? One of the most important things you have to do in order to understand a certain social invention is to understand the conditions under which the invention came to be alive. So we're going to play a little bit with a, 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 a thought experiment okay? um, that is structured mostly uh, at the moment, uh, in order to make things a little bit more clear, uh, it's not a thought experiment about the situation, the actual situation in which languages were, in, you know, invented back then, <coughs> when, uh, uh, at the beginning of the Homo sapiens period or something. I'm not going to say something about the evolution of language right now. I'm just going to uh, present something in order for us to be able to start thinking about what happens when we do not have language? What happens when the need for the invention of language arises? Okay? So try to think about uh, a very simple situation where you have four people uh, stranded somewhere on an island, okay? and they're just like us. They are modern human beings. They have their languages, English, Hungarian, Hebrew, or whatever. But the, the only problem is that they do not have a word in common. Okay, so none of them speaks a single word that any of the others understand. So as far as the mental issues are concerned, as far as the um, um, linguistic education of these people or whatever, you wanna, whichever you want to uh, uh, think about it, they are just regular people. But at the moment, because they are stranded on the island, because they only have their languages that the others do not speak, they do not have a language in common. Okay? And assume that they want to invent language for themselves. Assume that they want to create something. In, in this thought experiment, they are in a much better situation, much easier situation than the hominids that our ancestors. Uh, our ancestors, they know what the linguistic sign is, they know all the stuff. They now want to create something new for themselves uh, uh, in order to be able in order to be able to uh, uh, to talk to each other. There's a whole history of, uh, of uh, thought experiments of this type on the young head, uh, something, uh, you know, an, experiments, an experiment uh, of this type. Uh, uh, and uh, Herder uh, had something to say about the experiment and so on. I'm not going to get into all this, but 
at the, at the moment, we're just interested in the question of what is happening to these four people. Okay. The most crucial point of this first lecture, okay, every one of these, every one of the six lectures of the series is going to have a point that I'm going to try to, to push. Uh, the, the, mo the most important point is this. The problem that the four individuals are facing on their way to the invention of their language is not just the superficial problem of looking at the world around them and finding names for things that they see or for things that they want to do or uh, whatever. The most fundamental problem that they have is what we shall call here the social inaccessibility of private experiential cognition. Okay? And I will call this problem the experiential gap. Okay, so the first notion that I want to put on uh, gap. There are three or four different things to say about the experiential gap. The first thing that uh, we have to say is that each and every one of these people has access to the world only through his or her own experiences of the world. And these are radi radically different from each other. Okay? So uh, each of these people has experienced a different biography, uh, different things that, that these people know or feel or uh, have experience with or think or believe uh, and, and so on. A different baggage of memories, okay? uh, uh, different private histories of interactions with different worlds, okay? Uh, a grew up somewhere, C grew up somewhere else with different people um, um, and, and so on. Each of these people is differently experienced with relation to different things that are involved in their life, okay? So uh, you can play around with the island as much as you want, um, assume that there is, there are, you know, fish to fish uh, there in order to eat something, then, you know, allow one of them to be an expert fisher and another one to not know anything about uh, uh, fish. Um, allow them to have different ages, different genders, different levels of anxiety, uh, uh, different, uh, um, you know, uh, different capacities of interaction with the world, um, uh, and so on and so forth. It is always, as far as I'm concerned, very, very useful when you think about uh, um, this to just look around, uh, you know, in this room, for example, okay? And, and just, you know, spend like a minute uh, feeling, experiencing the fact that even though we are now speaking in a language that we know, English, uh, I speak, you listen, we interact between us, uh, the differences that we have between us in terms of the experience that we, experiences that we go through are in many ways much bigger, much more fundamental than what seems to be the case once we speak. So, um, uh, for example, uh, some of you I haven't met before, I think, right? So those of you who have never met me, uh, just see a guy with a beard, okay? There's you there here who simply can't concentrate on the lecture because he keeps saying to himself, what's this stupid beard thing? Because he has known me, it's part of his experiences of the world, he has known me without a beard. So part of Huda's experience of sitting here in the lecture is uh, trying to concentrate on what I'm saying uh, while looking at this thing, okay? Um, uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, let yourself see that. Uh, some people here are very, very tired after a very long day, finding it very hard to concentrate. Some have slept in the afternoon or, you know, before lucky people, uh, so they are less tired and so on and so forth. Some people here have experience with linguistics, some do not. Um, uh, and so on. Uh, so th these four people have different experiences of the world. Okay, uh, they look at the world differently, and not just that, uh, uh, they they have different capacities for perception. So um, you know, let one of those people, uh, you know, take B for example, um, be someone who has a, a, a very specific, specifically wonderfully wonderful talent for detail, looking at the, you know, at the small things, looking at the flowers and seeing the differences between each of them. Let another person here uh, uh, be someone 
who uh, find it very, very difficult to concentrate on you know, visual experiences for a long time. Not really, uh, you know, uh, th there are people who would, you know, stay somewhere for a month or two and you'd ask them about something in the apartment and you'd oh, I never saw that, you know, like, not, not really into looking at things that, that some of them have a, a good capacity for hearing and some not, and so on. Let the differences between these people uh, uh, you know, become a clear part of what, of, of what we're talking about. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, unless these people, uh, unless these four people are philosophy students uh, uh, or heads of departments of philosophy, they do not say to themselves, uh, aha, this is my perception of the world and the others may have a different perception. They just feel this is the way the world is. Okay, so for each of them, the world is a certain way. Uh, the, the experiences that each of these people has uh, is uh, uh, the sort of unreflexive uh, experience that just says uh, um, uh, this is how the world is, and none of them has any access to the experiences of the other. Okay, so uh, for the, the philosophers here, uh, I would remind you, for example, of, of uh, Locke's. Uh, story with the pineapple. Uh, there is no way I can tell what the pineapple looks, uh, tastes like in somebody else's uh, mouth. This is basically the situation that, that, that we're in. So the challenge the four people are facing in on their way to inventing a language for themselves is that the challenge of getting to a point where elements of their experience are already mutually identified, okay? I know that this element of the experience is something that you also share in order for us to be able to communicate about it. It's not that we're coming with the same experiences and looking for a way to create a formal system of communication. We have to, first of all, find elements in our experiences that are similar enough to each other for us to be able to even start thinking about creating a system of communication in order to talk about them. Okay? So, we have been used to two ways of thinking about experience. As you see, I'm, 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 I'm doing this piecemeal uh, and, and I, I'm not totally certain that, if, to judge from your question, I will be able to give you a full answer by the end of this lecture, but maybe on the, on the next one. We have all been used, at least in the cognitive science, sciences, to think about experiences, human experiences, in terms of the Kantian dictum that says that we as human beings experience the same way. There is something universal, universal about the way we experience, and we have already, in some other quarters, uh, become very used to the idea that people who belong to different cultures or who speak different languages experience the world the same way. Okay? The, 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 um, the, bottom, the, the foundation of everything that I'm going to talk about uh, in this lecture, the foundation of the entire theory, is the idea that uh, there is an experiential gap between each and every one of us and all the others. Each of us, it's not like we all experience the world the same way or members of the same culture uh, experience the world in, in the same way. Each and every one of us personally, individually experiences the world in a radically different way. Of course, there are points of convergence because otherwise we couldn't speak but we, we, we experience the world in a very different way. This is a part of our cognitive nature, okay? Uh, and language is not founded on our cognition. Language is a social tool that we invented in order to solve a problem that is cognitive, okay? So cognition is the problem. Language is a social solution to a problem of cognition. Okay, uh, Eva Yablonka, who I mentioned uh, before, um, um, having read this thing, and of course we've talked about this like endlessly, uh, she likes to call this point um, the, the point of the loneliness of other animals. Okay, as a biologist, she says there's a, there's, there's a, um, a, a fundamental thing to say about other animals, which is the total, not not total, because there are experiential ways to, to communicate. We'll talk about this too. But the very deep loneliness of um, being in the world, experiencing the world, and not being able 
to communicate your experiences to other people or to know how other people are experiencing this, uh, uh, their, their world, um, the, the, the loneliness, the inability to communicate, this is the cognitive essence, okay? Um, uh, and, and language is a social tool that was invented in order to be able to somehow bridge the experiential gap, find ways to communicate something, certain things across the experiential gap. And the way language does that uh, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is basically the following. It creates a space of signification okay, that each of us represents in, our, in, in his or her mind. Okay? Um, and the space of signification is a sort of conventionalized model of the world that is based on the uh, constant social process of mutual identification of points of experience that are similar enough between different people for us to be able to communicate about them. Okay? If we had done, I would play a game with you that I think would make it experientially much more, uh, much clearer. Uh, uh, I would just ask you to, you know, split into four groups and try to, you know, spend 15 minutes or a half hour inventing a language and you'll see that immediately. What happens when you start playing around with that is that your whole attention starts focusing not on the way you experience the world yourself individually, but on the question of which elements of my experience are elements that I can guess that the other is also sharing with me, okay? So um, um, the, uh, the, the space of signification is something that is built on a lot of hard work trying to find those points that are mutually identified between the experiences of, of, uh, um, of different people. Assume that A here are, are, are um, you know, one of the four uh, people involved in the game, uh, um, points at something, okay, and says chair, okay? First word, and please do not ask me how a chair got on the, uh, uh, on the island. Uh, there's a very, very long tradition uh, of uh, speaking about chairs when you want to talk about something that people, um, you know, um, point at and, and, and call by name. And I'm definitely not, definitely not going to be the first one to stop this wonderful speech. So there was a chair on the island before they arrived there. Maybe people got there before they did or whatever. What is happening with this pointing event? Okay? Uh, uh, what, are, what is important to understand about the pointing? is that the more important part of the event is the pointing and not the naming, in the following sense, okay? You have the four people there, and each of them lives in his or her own experiential world, and what the pointing says is, hey, you guys, okay, stop dreaming. Stop looking here and there. Stop living your own individual life. I want all of you now to direct your attention here, okay? Now, when I do this, and everybody else looks at where I point, this is a moment, this is a moment in which, supposedly, okay, it doesn't have to happen, but most chances are that for that very short moment of pointing, if everybody looks at what I'm pointing at, at that moment we have a similar experience that we can call mutually identified, okay? So if you all, if all three others are looking at that thing, then first of all, we know even if each of us experiences the world in a completely different way. On that specific second, we all experience the same thing. And now we call that thing that we mutually identified in terms of the experience, we call it chair, okay? So we do not call chair the thing in the world, and we do not call chair the thing in our experience of the world. We call chair the thing around which we mutually identify the fact that we all experience the same thing at the same time. Okay? Yeah. Because if they can understand your sign. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, okay, of course, of course. We're, 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 uh, we're uh, getting to the Gamma Guy thing in the moment. Okay, so, so uh, Quine, uh, you know, Quine will arrive in, 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 a, in a minute. So, so uh, of course, if we all, if we all, sorry, what's that? If we all, if we all, uh, 
if we all manage to do everything in a perfect way, okay, then at that moment we all, all four people experience the same thing at the same time, and then the name signifies that point of mutual identification of the experience. Okay, what what the name? What does it signify? No, okay. the chair, but something else. Okay, let me let me let me give you the exact. Okay, uh, uh, the the um, the language does not refer in this sense to the world or to our experiences of the world. It refers to the sense of mutual identification among the community of similar experiences. So the word chair refers to the similar experience of the chair. Okay? I wouldn't say so. I could see that from the very beginning. Can you tell me what you would say? I would say that the word chair signifies the chair because it's one of them. Bring me the chair, please. Yeah. It's not uh, intending that uh, a set of mutual uh, uh, Sure. <laughs> this, sure. This, this, the, the, the question of what happens when one of them says, bring me the chair, is a question about the, an activity of communication in which the people involved use the socially invented system of language in order to communicate. I will talk about that next year, okay? When we talk about what happens when we communicate using the mutual identified system, then of course, what we intend to do is get people to bring us the actual chair, not the sense of mutual identification. But, but, what is happening uh, at the moment, and this is why I said we have to describe a lot, what we're interested in is not the process of communication using the system, but the question of what happens when the system is being being invented, okay? And the point that I'm, the, the point that is important for me at the moment is uh, just the, the, the fact that if each of us has a, a world of experience, okay, that is different from the others, okay, what happens when we point is that we tell to each other, now at this moment we have extracted a certain point out of our experiences and what we know about it is that this is this point is something that both of us can identify and we can actually do the mutual identification thing. I know that you know and you know that I know, okay? It is only then, once we are able to do that, that we can move on to the second pro second step in which we actually use this for communication and that is something eventually people will want the chair brought to them, not something else. But you'll have to give me a little bit more time. Okay? I'm sorry about this. Yes. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem that what we mutually identify is, is the experience, but the chair. Because I, I don't see the point that in, in, at what point did the experience that people have come comes into uh, you know inventing a word for for chair. Because it doesn't really matter what they experience when they look at the chair. The point is that when someone just work for the chair, they all look at them. They, they don't have this experience. It doesn't. Okay, okay. As, as I, let me, let me say the exact thing that I found myself saying to uh, the linguist I talked to on the first lecture there, okay? Uh, uh, th there's a lot of philosophers here. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> you are very sensitive to some of the issues that I'm raising here, and I appreciate that very much. But I, you will have to give me a little bit more time to tell a certain story. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I promise to give you answers, but I cannot do it right now. It, just assume that I'm thinking in terms that you disagree with, and that some stories that you disagree with are nevertheless interesting, okay? So think of it like as fiction, okay? I'm, I'm giving you a story that is not right but you're already stuck in the room. So let me, let, me, uh, let, me just go on. let me just go on for a while, and I promise, okay, I really do, I promise that these questions will get an answer. Okay, yeah. Just, uh, you know, yeah. make a note for the record. Yeah. Um, we are starting uh, with, um, but please, now I'm more and more, uh, understand, I understand okay. more and more for a uh, concept of experience. Okay. Um, you are starting with different people with different experiences. That's right. Um, and I doubt whether that's the case. Uh, perhaps we start, we should 
start or we do start a different people in the common world. And then the, the problem you are trying to overcome mm -hmm. uh, does not exist uh, in the first place. Okay. Fine. So again, so again. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, I understand that this is a place that you can... Let, let, me, let me tell you a little story. Okay, let me tell you a little story and, uh, and uh, use it in order to, to you know, explain something that is fundamental, not just to me personally, but to this whole series. Okay? Uh, the, the story, I don't know if it's, it's probably not true, but it's, it's a wonderful story about Einstein, who at some point gave a lecture about relativity. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, there was an old woman in the crowd, and she raised her hand and she said, uh, and she said, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Professor Einstein, uh, you know that you're you're wrong with what you're saying. Okay, uh, um, the Earth uh, does not float in, in space the way you say it does. There's a huge turtle beneath the Earth. It just you know it holds the the, the, the Earth together. You know, in place, and he, he asked her, uh, "So, my dear lady, what holds the turtle?" Uh, and she said, "Ah, you're 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 a smart boy, but there's you know everybody knows that it's turtles all the way down." Okay, that's the story. <laughs> Why am I bringing you the story? Because part of the attempt to rethink linguistics as a discipline, okay, and found it on a different place in order to get to questions about language that are linguistic questions, okay? Uh, uh, has to do with the need to find yourself at, at the lowest turtle and stick to it, okay? Find yourself something that you assume as a basis and then, you know, gradually build something on that that reaches the point where you can start answering, say, empirical questions about languages that are very, very important, okay? Uh, it is in the nature of what I'm doing here that I'm describing the lowest turtle of my theory. Okay, I'm saying this is a foundation. Uh, the experiential gap between individuals is a foundation of the theory. Okay, I would really not like to uh, waste all the time that we have right now in uh, uh, arguing about the question of whether we agree or disagree about this foundation. I hope, and that's nothing I can do beyond hoping. I hope that once we get to the point where this thing starts solving actual problems, for example, the, question, the, the problem of the meanings of words. What is the meaning of a word, okay? Uh, what is a linguistic sign? Very, very you know, practical things like that. I only can hope that once we get to those problems, the reasonableness of the lowest turtle will start to assert itself, okay? Um, you may start with a different assumption. And, and try to see where it takes you. I think that this is, you know, I have found this to be very useful for me. Uh, but again, you know, it's, it's, th there's something in the, in the situation that we're in, uh, in which I kind of ask you to remain with your disagreement. And, you know, there's nothing to do, there's nothing to do with that. I will be starting not to develop a discussion, but just to first uh, disagree. Sure, sure, sure. I, I understand. It's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very reasonable disagreement. Uh, uh, yeah. Even so, yeah. uh, to the extent that uh, this is a common set of shared experience of different cognitive perceptions, therefore, language is only a minimalist form of communication That's very true. of the different cognitive That's experiences. Very true. Is uh, what I think of as reducing language 
to its natural size in a period that, you know, the, the, the say, postmodern period in the most general sense, but like 20th century, you know, a period in which we have come to have very um, um, uh, all over, I mean, some, uh, century. Exactly. Like very exaggerated, very exaggerated views of what language is and what language can do. Okay? You're very right in, in capturing that. Putting language inside the vast world of experience, the first thing that it does, and the second thing that it does, is reduce it to its natural size. But again, we don't have to. Okay. Um, uh, assume, assume that A pointed at a chair and said chair, okay? And assume that we have somehow managed to go beyond Quine's problem with the Gava guy that I think most of you probably know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the other three managed to understand that what A is pointing at is the chair and not the upholstery or one of the legs or any of the other elements that could be named by the, by, uh, uh, the word. Now we're in a situation where a, a part of the experience of each of the four people is the knowledge that, due to the event of pointing, there is now an isolated point of experience that is mutually identified with the others, okay? And uh, 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 the, the point that is mutually identified with the others for each of the four people is still couched within the experiential world of that person. So, for example, assume that uh, C is an expert on furniture. Okay, he knows everything there is to know about the differences between, you know, different types of chairs and different types of whatever. As far as he is concerned, it is very possible that he would interpret A's pointing and naming as saying, okay, from now on, when we see a dining table chair of that type, we call it chair. Okay, uh, assume that D, okay, has never seen chairs before. Okay, you can assume that. Uh, D would say, okay, fine. From now on, when we see something that looks like this, we will call it a chair. Assume that B is very, very tired, and uh, all B wants to do is sit down and rest. Uh, for B, the word chair would um, uh, be a word that refers to something that you can see on. Okay, so we are in a position where, even though the four individuals managed to mutually identify something in their uh, experiences and call it by a name, it is not at all certain that they have mutually identified the same thing, okay? So from now on, you can imagine a whole history of communication and miscommunication using uh, the word. For example, if, um, uh, if uh, B would walk around the island, okay, and see something that is like a stool, as far as B is concerned, the word chair can be used in order to refer to the stool. Uh, B would come back to the other three and with the combination of hand waves and the word chair would say, come and help me pick up that thing that as far as B is concerned is a chair. C would go there, would see that it's a stool and not a chair because the word chair is only for dining table chairs, could get angry at B and so on and so forth. There's a situation in which at that point, okay, C might decide that the difference between a stool and a chair is too big, point at the stool, say stool, meaning as far as I'm concerned in terms of my experiences, there's a huge difference between these two things, and to the extent that the other, thing would, other three people would agree to go along with that, we'd have two words in the language, but you should understand that this is something very important. The other three should not necessarily accept that, and C should not necessarily try to do it, okay? So they may stay with one word, or they may have two words, or they may then have three, and at each point in this process, the, uh, the, the, the gradual construction of the, the, the lexicon, of that space of signification, would be a result of the um, uh, uh, naming activities that these four people will be engaged in, not just in terms of the question of whether each of these four people would decide to point a name, but also, and not less importantly, whether the other three would accept the naming 
decide to go along with it, and so on and so on. Okay, uh, and, and again, you can do that indefinitely, and this is actually what is happening to us indefinitely with our languages. Uh, uh, C would say, no, this is a stool, it's not a chair. Okay? Uh, B would say, oh, come on. You know, I'm going to go on calling everything a chair. I, don't, I mean, this, it really doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's something you sit on. You know, what's, what's the big deal? Okay? A would say, A would say uh, I'm very much uh, interested in having a good social relationship with C. And I see that it's very, very important for C that we distinguish between chairs and stools. I don't see the real difference in terms of my experience, but let's go along with it. So as long as now they have two words, okay? And as far as the space of signification between the four is concerned, the space of signification is quite ordered, okay? There, there were pointing events, there were naming events, there were agreements, but in the mind of each of these four people, you may have diff totally different representations of what has happened because the, the history of what has happened has been registered in the mind of each of these people on the basis of the experience, experiential history of that person. And because they come into the story different, they keep on being different, okay? Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and you can, and you can uh, 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 take this you know, as, 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 as far away as, as, as you want in your imagination, okay? Uh, there's going to be a, a question that is going to go with these four people as long as they go on uh, inventing. And, and of course, we still go on inventing every day, okay? Uh, some of us. But, but, uh, 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 and, and the question is going to be the question of the threshold of distinction. When is something different enough from what we have already called by a name in order for us to call it by another name, okay? Now this, again, is not a question about the world, and it's not a question about our experiences of the world, it's a question about the extent to which we can reach social agreement about the uh, uh, addition of another name to the lexicon that we already have, okay? So, um, um, if you look at the world, um, uh, basically, there is no... Uh, uh, um, The word is an, is an endless continuum of distinction and similarity. Everything may be thought of as different or similar from everything else in this way or the other, okay? Uh, for example, uh, uh, if we go on thinking about chairs, okay? Uh, there are chairs that are beautiful and not beautiful. There are chairs that are heavy and not heavy, okay? The four people may have uh, had to carry an armchair somewhere, and they experienced very vividly the fact that that chair that they were carrying was very, very heavy. And there are chairs that are not that heavy, uh, um, but they probably, maybe they would, but as, when we look at languages that we know, we, we see that, you know, we do not really have separate words to designate heavy chairs and light chairs, beautiful chairs and, and, uh, and uh, ugly chairs, old chairs and new chairs, and so on. But we do have words uh, to designate chairs as opposed to beanbags, as opposed to stools, as opposed to other things. In different, in different languages, by the way, we'll get to that. There's nothing universal going on there. But the, the, the thing is that the threshold of distinction that is, that, that is going to play a role in this process uh, again and again is, uh, uh, is a social thing it is, a, it is about finding common ground, okay, in the, in the sense that I have my own experiential world, you have, each of you has a, an experiential world. We do not have a language yet to, to communicate that. We have to find words that refer to points of mutual uh, uh, identification, and we cannot do that for each and every little thing that we find. We have the, 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 the process itself uh, um, says, asserts, demands that we decide whether something is similar enough to something else for us to use the same word that we already have. Okay, so this is a chair that we call chair. Okay, now you know, give it, uh, you know, make it orange. Uh, there's a question: Do we still want to call it a chair? And maybe one of us would say, no, 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 orange chairs 
for orangers, I need a different word. They are extremely different, okay? But then maybe the rest of us, the rest of us will say, no, no, I'm sorry, this is too much for us, okay? Uh, uh, we're not going to use the word. So that, that there's always going to be a question of uh, uh, um, a social threshold, threshold of distinction that is socially negotiated among the group, and it can be totally different in different groups, and so on, uh, uh, and so forth, in which, which actually creates a situation which is the following, okay? Each of us experiences the word analogically, okay? Uh, uh, many fuzzy boundaries, many things that are this thing and also the other thing, uh, many similarities and differences that are uh, in, in many ways very, very chaotic, uh, very fuzzy, very analogical. The, the essence of the social process of mutual identification, pointing and naming, is one in which we, 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 we mark digital points in our experiential worlds whose essence, the digital essence, is, 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 is a result of the fact that we have mutually identified these points together with others and have given them names. And when I say that this is the essence, it doesn't mean that this is actually the essence, because as I said before, it may be, we may be completely wrong. We may think that we have the same word for the same thing, but we do not. What is going on here is that we build a space of signification between us that is based on the assumption, the belief, the belief, the social belief, that we're actually use the same words in order to talk about the same things. We digitize points of experience, and we say these points uh, are creating a totally different level that is based on the notion of mutual identification. I don't know if you experience the world like I do in all the other places, but where we've already gone through the ritual of pointing and naming, there I at least have some uh, uh, reason to assume that when I use the word, it refers to an experience that is in your mind that is similar enough to the experience that I have uh, um, uh, in my mind. Okay, let me call this uh, space of signification that is gradually building up between uh, 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 the people. Let me call it the symbolic landscape. Uh, and let it be. Let it be. A, 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 a basically a model of the world, which is radically simplified. Okay, that that is you know first step towards what you were saying. It is radically simplified because it is based on a huge amount of work of uh, uh, a social work of mutual identification. We cannot, we do not want to, and we cannot get to a point where we have mutually identified all of our experiences together with one another. We choose and pick points in our experiences that we may find, that, that, that we feel that we can mutually identify, and we create a symbolic landscape between us that is digital, uh, um, that, that is uh, uh, stripped down, um, uh, and that is supposed to refer to, it is supposed to stand for, the amount of agreement that we manage to create between us in terms of the similarities between our different experiences of the world, okay? Uh, which means that language does not refer to the world uh, uh, as such, okay? Although we use it to communicate about the world, it does not as such refer to the world, it does not as such refer to our experiences of the world, it mediates between the different experiences of the speakers, it creates a world, and, and, uh, and, and the world is related the symbolic landscape is related to the real world only through the negotiated prism of social negotiation, of social agreement, okay? So the symbolic landscape is related to the real world through the prism of social agreement, okay? Now, what this leads us is, where this leads us is the next point. The next point is, what does this mean about the linguistic sign? What is a linguistic sign? What is a sign? Because we said that there are things here that have been pointed and named, okay? Um, uh, the word chair was used in order to refer to something, okay? So what are words? What are signs? There is basically uh, 
uh, a consensus among different people who think about science uh, in different um, worlds, you know, intellectual worlds, uh, that is centered around the, the, the notion of the double nature of the sun, the signifier and the signifier. Okay? Uh, and now this is something that in linguistics and semiotics has been uh, basically you know, based on the Saussure's thinking uh, in formal semantics. There's a lot of, of, of this type of thinking. What I've said until now basically calls for a different conception of the sign, uh, not as a double nature thing, but as a triple nature thing. Okay? And so uh, I, I like to do this thing very low, these things very low tech, so I'm going to draw something on the board. Okay. Uh, Elements on the on the uh, on the symbolic landscape 
are also semantically related to each other. Okay? So, for example, if there is a situation in which somebody points to me uh, at a chair and says chair, and I manage to go through enough of the experience of learning of this of acquisition, where I, I where, where I eventually get to the point where the cluster of experiences of chair looking, chair, chair seeing, chair smelling, chair touching, chair sitting, and all these experiences are associated systematically with the word, with the signified chair in the symbolic landscape and the signifier here, okay? And then somebody else does the same thing for me, with the same person, does this very same thing for me, for the word seat, okay? Where a set of experiences of sitting are associated with the signified uh, seat, then the fact that uh, there is a correlation between the experiences of sitting and the experiences of, of sharing, you know, the experiences of uh, seeing a chair and the experiences of sitting on a chair are associated with the experiences of sitting on a chair, okay? There are systematic relationships between the experiences, uh, then this means that there would be a systematic uh, uh, relationship between uh, the, the signifies, so you have a, uh, you know, let me do this, that you have semantic relationships between the different signifies on the level of the symbolic landscape, okay, which together create the model of the world, okay, the model of the world including the relationship between the different elements in the world and uh, um, the, 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 the symbolic landscape would be systematically associated with our experiences privately, but it would also be the social system that allows us uh, eventually to communicate and remember, remember, please, this is important and it's going to come back again and again, this whole thing is always in flux and always changing and it's never perfect, okay, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, there is no really serious reason to assume that it looks the same for each and every person and when you get, for example, when you get, for example, to, you know what, let me just stop and I'll start the sentence again. Okay, there has been an obsession in linguistics. Okay, now I'm kind of talking to you. I'm talking to you, but somehow. There is an obsession, there has been an obsession with linguistics, in linguistics, with trying to understand what is happening when communication works right. Okay, when, when we communicate with each other and it actually works. And the attempt to understand miscommunication has somehow been kind of you know, pushed aside. One of the things that I'm going to try to show, but it will take me some time, okay, is that the most important and intriguing and interesting, crucial uh, phenomenon in order for us to understand language are the, 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 the events of miscommunication. Okay? Language is a system that is prone to miscommunication. It is a very imperfect system. It is a system that is based on a chaotic social process that, uh, th that creates very many different types of events of miscommunication. And when you start building the whole story that, that the way I'm building it, you can start explaining miscommunication uh, um, and not push it aside, okay? From my point of view, uh, whenever communication works with language, it's a sort of a miracle. And, 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 and most of what is happening is miscommunication. And when you look, when you look at this, when you look at the system this way, um, you can start to understand some of the things that are happening, okay? Um, uh, we start with the fact that even though each and every one of us has these three elements uh, with a, with a, uh, with a uh, semantic model on the symbolic landscape and the signifiers and the experiences, the, the essence of the process that has led us to have it is one that does not guarantee that we have the same thing in our mind. It actually almost guarantees that there would always be differences um, um, between, be, between us. And when you analyze, for example, situations of dialogue between people, okay, you can see many, many times that people feel that they argue about something, whereas what is actually happening is that they have different representations of the words that they are using. They work with the assumption that the words mean the same thing. 
but they actually do not mean the same thing for these different people. And because of that, the, the, the process is one uh, uh, in which we have different experiences of the world. We try to work out certain ways of communication through this, the, the, the symbolic landscape, but it just is more difficult than we, than, than we usually do. There's a long history in, in linguistics and in philosophy of science uh, uh, in terms of trying to understand how words mean, okay? How do we know what words mean? And generally speaking, uh, there have been two major conceptions, okay? And I will ask the forgiveness of the philosophers here for, you know, saying this in a generalized way. But I think that basically, People started out at the beginning of the 20th century, 20th century uh, with, with a general conception that said that words mean by definitions. Okay? Words mean because uh, you can find um, uh, a sets of necessary and sufficient conditions for the meanings of the words. And what we know, the way we know the meanings of words, is that we have uh, um, uh, sets of definitions uh, for the world, for the word, and if in those cases where all the conditions are met, then we know that the word, you know, then we know what the word refers to. So uh, um, this is basically the same idea as you have in dictionaries. The word chair, uh, uh, the, the meaning of the word chair is, uh, um, you know, a piece of furniture uh, with four legs. Uh, and the back used for seeing something like that. Okay? Um, this was the general idea, and there's a long and very, very interesting uh, uh, history uh, involving uh, Wittgenstein, of course, and uh, um, uh, Jerry Fodor uh, um, and others who have shown uh, in all kinds of ways, uh, Eleanor Roche uh, have shown in all kinds of ways that this doesn't, that, that this simply doesn't work. Okay? Uh, it cannot be the case that the way we represent the meanings of words in our minds is by definitions. There are two types of arguments that are especially uh, uh, interesting uh, in, in this respect. The one is that definitions can never be exhausted. Okay? Jerry Fodor has a wonderful, wonderful paper in which he works on the meaning of the word to pay, the verb to pay. And he gives it a definition, you know, the paper. He gives it a definition and then shows you a case in which the definition doesn't work. And then he adds something to the definition in order for it to work for that case. Uh, you know, would we want to say that Michelangelo, while putting his brush into the uh, into the paint and covering the brush from all sides with the paint, we want to say that Michelangelo painted the brush? No, we don't want to do that. So we have to find another element to add to the definition. And the definition becomes bigger and bigger, uh, and there's always going to be another thing that you have to add to the definition in order, in order to be able to make it work for all, uh, for all cases. So uh, um, exhaustiveness is, is a crucial element in the notion of necessary and sufficient conditions, and it doesn't. <coughs> then there's the other, then there's the other uh, problem, which is the problem of circularity. Okay? So you say, uh, you say that the, the verb paint means uh, to cover with paint, to cover with a certain material, uh, 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 in order to, in order to use the material to cover a certain surface or something like that, uh, and then you find yourself in a very strange situation. Before we didn't know how to define paint. Now you have to find definitions for cover and for surface and for all these things. And when you start with that, you see that it just gets out of hand very, very quickly. Um, um, you want to define the meaning of a word, and you find yourself having to define the meaning of hundreds of words because they all participate in the different definitions of the words that you use in order to define the word that you want to define. So uh, uh, it simply doesn't work. Okay, so that was that was the first um, uh, stage in the development of this, starting with necessary and sufficient conditions, and say growing out of it, understanding. Uh, uh, gradually that it doesn't work. The second uh, uh, stage in this uh, uh, 
um, you could call the Wittgensteinian reaction. Again, in general, uh, uh, in a, a, a sort of general name, Elinor Roche is the most important player uh, in this, uh, apart from Wittgenstein himself. And the idea is, again, generally speaking, you know, forget necessary and sufficient conditions. You have conditions for the meanings of words, okay? So having four legs, uh, people sit on it, it has a back, all kinds of things like that. You have conditions, okay? But they're not necessarily insufficient, they're just there as a list. And those elements in the world that more read that can be more readily called chairs are those elements that are the most prototypical. They have that they meet most of the conditions, or all of the conditions uh, related to the word chair. Certain things are less prototypical. They are not the types of chairs that you would think about like this. And they have a, a, a smaller, they meet a smaller set of the conditions uh, related to chairs, okay? So prototypicality theory um, is in general the second answer, okay? Uh, it comes uh, of course, from uh, Wittgenstein's uh, discussion of, of the word game and, and, and other notions, and uh, um, it has done quite a lot of good uh, in terms of understanding certain aspects of what's going on um, uh, with words. You take the word pet, for example, the word that a lot of people work on, you give uh, a, a, a whole set of, um, of conditions for something to be a pet, and then you see that things like cats and dogs um, meet most of the conditions or all of them, and you know the fish that you have in your aquarium uh, meet a, a much smaller uh, uh, number of conditions, and together you find yourself in a situation where you can't. Prototypicality theory has created problems, problems of its own, which are not less serious than the problems that we had with necessary and sufficient conditions. Again, I would just like to refer you to two uh, uh, two types of, of, of uh, problems. The first problem is that uh, uh, we have a very, very clear intuition that sometimes prototypicality simply has nothing to do with what we think about the meaning of the word. Okay? Uh, the best example, the easiest example is the word grandmother. Okay? Uh, we have a very ready list of prototypical properties of grandmothers. Okay? We have no problem uh, uh, enumerating them a certain age, a certain type of behavior with, uh, with children drinking sweets and, and you know, chicken soup and, and napping and you know, whatever. You know. Think of your prototypical grandmother and you'll see. Okay. However, we also know that the word grandmother refers to a female parent of a parent, and we know that someone can be a grandmother uh, at the age of you know, like 36, uh, uh, going out to you know, parties and partying all night, if she has a son or a daughter and they have a kid, she's a grandmother. So prototypicality theory loses something here that we had in the necessary and sufficient conditions story, uh, and, and it's, 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 a, it's a serious difficulty. The other uh, thing is, uh, is, is, the other problem is this. Uh, if all we have is prototypicality theory, okay, uh, then we have a problem with very, very non-prototypical members of sets. So, here we go. Think about the word like camera, okay? You say uh, there's a whole set of, of, uh, there's a whole set of um, uh, properties. So, for example, having four legs would be uh, a property of camels. Uh, and now we can, uh, because it's only a prototypicality condition, uh, we can solve a problem that we had in, in the first view, the necessary sufficient condition, a camel with three legs, okay? A horrible accident. Camel lost a leg. A camel with three legs is still a leg because uh, because uh, it, it, you know it's just a less prototypical camel with necessary and sufficient conditions. It would not be a camel at that moment. Then. So we solve that. But a problem comes with that. What prevents us from uh, thinking about a mouse as a very 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 non prototypical camel? Okay, nothing in the theory of prototypicality uh, saves you from that. Because once you open things to prototypicality judgments, 
um, uh, things become uh, very fluid, you can say, okay, this is a very non prototypical car, it's very small, you know, and so on. Uh, uh, the Hyvex is an elephant. Sorry? The Hyvex is an elephant. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so uh, uh, um, just like necessary and sufficient conditions were, uh, were, were, too, um, uh, were too strong, uh, prototypicality is too weak. It accepts cases that it should not accept. Okay? Uh, let me just say the final word and then we can see with the philosophers if they, if they want to look at the, at the details. Once you separate the sign into three, uh, into three um, uh, uh, elements, and you can show very, I think, very.